I'm really pleased to be joined by a large panel of five people for this session. So we're going to have a lot of experiences uh, and stories to share, I think. And definitely please do put your questions and observations in the chat. We will be keeping an eye out. I'm going to ask my panel to introduce themselves because they will do a much better job of it than I would. And they're going to tell us a bit about uh, who they are, what they do, what they've done and how they got there, I suppose, as a brief introduction. And uh, I think I will start with Jenny as you are unmuted. <laughs> God, that was a mistake. Uh, hello, I'm Jenna Mathiasen. Um, I have been working as a conservator for eight years. I had to check. Um, I've had loads of different jobs, uh, big and small institutions, commercial units, all sorts of things. And now I am a freelancer as of a couple of months. So woohoo. Um, I also run the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. So if I sound ever so slightly familiar, that might be why. Um, I did science at school. I grew up in Sweden. I uh, did science. Um, I had an interest in history and archaeology, but I was always told, don't be an archaeologist. There's no jobs. There's no jobs. Liars. They're all liars. But anyway, um, it meant that I moved to the UK to go to university, where I actually did heritage management, which uh, included a little bit of building conservation and archaeology and all sorts. So it was a bit of a pick and mix. And then I figured out that, no, it's all about the museums. Uh, and it's all about the objects for me. So I went and did a conservation degree, a master's degree in Cardiff. Um, so that's how I ended up becoming a conservator. But it was all due to this magical woman I met on a work placement when I was 17. Because I didn't know conservators existed before then. I'd never heard of them. Uh, but there she was in a museum where I was doing a placement. And she was just like, yo, I wear a lab coat. You should be a conservator. And I was like, I will consider this. Make all the wrong choices. And then figure it out when I'm about 23. You're welcome. That's me. Thank you so much. That's a brilliant introduction. I'm uh, going to go around uh, on my screen. And the next person that I can see is Lorraine. Hello, everybody. My name's Lorraine Finch. I'm an accredited conservator. I've been working in conservation for 25 years, the last 17 of those as a freelance accredited conservator. I specialise with archives and within that specialise with um, the conservation and preservation of film, sound and photography. I offer um, practical conservation and preservation mainly to institutions, so they're my biggest clients um, working with institutions. However, over the last three or four years I've been diversifying the business, so I now do a lot of consultancy, project management, um, I work as an assessor for various cultural heritage um, diploma qualifications and apprenticeships in conservation and I'm all, I also offer teaching and training so I have quite a diverse um, diverse work and I really enjoy that it's one of the things that I really love about being a conservator is the diversity of what um, I get to do and to see like Jenny um, my introduction to conservation came through a magical woman called Sheila who worked at that point at the Elizabethan house in Great Yarmouth and I finished my first degree and I said, hmm, what, do I, what, what could I do uh, in the art sector, in museums, what jobs are there? And she mentioned conservation and I checked. I was told when I was 16 that my combination of arts and sciences A-levels would get me nowhere. And I had to either concentrate on arts or sciences um, being the person that I am. I did listen, but then did my own thing anyway and combined arts and sciences. So Sheila said to me, go at conservation. So I did, realized I had all the con qualifications, a uh, bit of art, bit of science, practical, made things like doing stuff with my hands, applied for the course at Campbell, got onto it, and that's it. That's why I'm here now. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I think that um, mix of art and sciences is quite, uh, will come up again, I suspect, in conversation today. Uh, Gwen, I wonder if you could introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Gwen Thomas and I'm the Collections Care Officer at uh, Museums and Galleries Edinburgh. Um, I'm a Collections Care Conservator. I uh, did an undergrad in history at Cardiff and I knew that I wanted to work in history and I had a summer job at St Fagans, which is a museum um, just outside Cardiff, which is awesome if you haven't been there. Uh, it's historic buildings from all over Wales and as part of my induction, um, we got a tour of the stores and uh, of the conservation studios with the conservators and that was when I found out that conservation was a thing 
uh, by which point I was 21. So <laughs> I was like, oh, it would have been nice to know that when I was 17, but there you go. Um, so uh, I then worked for a year, um, just getting some money and uh, then applied to do the MSc in Care of Collections at Cardiff. And then after that, I worked for the National Trust in London. Then I moved to the Science Museum in London. And then I moved up to Scotland in 2017 to take up my current role. Um, and I'm also on the Icon Scotland group committee and uh, was confirmed as the new chair yesterday. So exciting times. Oh, fantastic. Well, congratulations on your uh, appointment. That's fantastic. And I think we're going to talk about some things related to Icon a bit later as well. Uh, Julie, I wonder if you could introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, I'm Julie Bond. I'm Head of Collections Care at the National Library of Scotland. I just started that job last year. Prior to that, I worked at the National Trust for Scotland for 12 years. Um, I think I've probably been in conservation for about 16 years now, sadly. Um, and my interest, much like Gwen's, was peaked when I was doing my undergraduate art history, modern history. Where does that take you? No idea. I um, decided to do some voluntary work and did volunteer for the National Trust for Scotland at New Hales House, which is just outside Musselburgh. Fantastic. You must visit when it's open again. Um, and that's where I realised that what I had heard of conservation, but assumed it was very science based and that had put me off. Um, but when I realised it was more about applied science and understanding the materials and, and how to use that science, um, it, it kind of opened that door for me. So I knew that I wanted to work for the National Trust for Scotland. That was my dream job. I knew I wanted to move into preventive conservation quite quickly, but I didn't want to study it. I wanted to get a grounding in different materials. So I did the master's at Lincoln University. Um, which at that point was called Conservation of Historic Objects. I believe it's now Conservation of Cultural Heritage. There's an interesting one for discussion. Um, and, and then after that, got, got a number of project jobs. I'm sure that's quite a similar theme for a lot of people. You know, you've got to go where the work is for a while. And then I got the job with, with NTS and, uh, and worked there for 12 years. So that's where I'm at now. Thank you so much. I think uh, the project roles aspect, I suspect, will come up also in some of our uh, later questions. And finally, uh, Rain, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. H Hello, everyone. Good morning from my time. I'm Rain Poisson. I'm from Canada. Uh, and so it's morning for me, but it's the afternoon for all of you. And I'm a emerging conservator. I'm within the first five years uh, of my conservation career. And like everyone else, I had no idea what conservation was. <laughs> I actually started with a fine art degree first, a Bachelor of Fine Arts. Uh, I liked painting chicken, chickens and clouds, but that's not a full-time career apparently. And so I had to figure out what to do from there. Uh, and I knew I still wanted to work within museums or heritage. I just needed something. Uh, because I didn't want to be a curator and I didn't want to deal with artists. We're a bunch of flaky people. We're weird. Don't want to deal with that. I was able to talk to uh, someone I knew at the museum back home in my small town. And I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't want to be a curator, but I would really love just to work with the objects. Is that even a thing? And she said, yeah, that's a thing. That's totally a thing. You can just work with the objects. And that just blew my mind. I looked up a program I could take at Fleming College in Ontario, a postgraduate degree. And I was luckily able to volunteer first in Saskatoon at the Western Development Museum in their lab, just to see if I liked it first. And I absolutely did. And I knew, okay, this is where my skills with using my hands, being tactile, being finagly, like works for me. Uh, the sciencey side, scares me, still scares me. I'm more the artsy fartsy person, but like I did get through chemistry in school and I do understand the basics. <laughs> and so since graduating, I've been able to work all across Canada. I've worked in, uh, you know, Saskatoon, Ottawa, Ontario, Kitchener, Ontario, Winnipeg in Manitoba. And now currently I'm in uh, Williams Lake BC uh, in a position. Today's actually my last day. And so I, I guess I'll go back to freelancing or just bouncing around till I find a job. 
And so that's me. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for that introduction. I think what's really interesting that's come through from all of you is that you didn't know that conservation would be an option until it uh, became an option from from various magical women or other uh, work experience uh, scenarios and I think that's really interesting uh, reflection on kind of the role of conservation perhaps sometimes it is very it can be very hidden uh, I think in some organizations um, I'm going to ask uh, what is a uh, a big question but I think one that's that's really important and you've touched on it uh, all of you in some of what you've said about what you how you got into it but I'd like to think a bit around what are the key skills that you think that someone would need if they want to work in conservation or collections care um, and I'm gonna start this time with Gwen because you are unmuted. <laughs> um. So yeah, I had a bit of think about this and um, I think that you definitely need to be quite a patient person and it depends on what branch of conservation you decide to go into because you've got things like, well, more like what Judy and I do, which is quite holistic um, in that it's, you know, looking at the environments and the general well-being of objects, or you've got bench work, which is more like surgery. I tend to think of myself as more of a GP for objects and uh, then you know, specialist conservators as, yeah, medical specialists or surgeons. Um, and so having, yeah, having that kind of sense of patience and that things have to happen over the longer term uh, is really important uh, for, for the preventive side of things. But equally, if you're at a bench with an object for a really long time, you also need a, a different sort of patience for that and to enjoy doing things that can be quite routine because a lot of it is scraping or hoovering um, and you have to enjoy that. Uh, and see what there is at the other end of it. Um, I think having really good observation skills uh, to see when there are changes in objects um, or changes in the environment, you know, smelling that something isn't quite right, for example, um, not being too afraid of data analysis. It doesn't have to be like scary, scary data analysis, but being able to understand graphs and things like that, or, you know, other experiments that you might be doing. Um, problem solving, definitely. Um, and being a good communicator, because sometimes what you do is a mystery to the other people that you work with. Excellent. I love that that metaphor of kind of uh, being a general practitioner in medicine versus being a surgeon in terms of kind of these roles. I think that's uh, really because I don't fully understand conservation. I think I find that a really uh, a metaphor I can really relate to. So thank yeah. you. It's really important, I think, um, because yeah. Like often if you say you're a conservative, people think that means that you can fix everything. And it's like, well, no, because I'm, you know, if it's like, a, say, a silk banner, you need a, a textile conservator for that. I can't I can't just go and do that. That would be unethical probably for me to try. I can pack it and tell you how to display it and things like that. But um, yeah, I think that it, the, the certainly the understanding of conservation and what it is is a mystery. And certainly the subsections within it, I think, is even more of a mystery for people because they just think conservatives are magical people that can wave a wand and fix every single thing. <laughs> and we can't definitely uh jenny i'll come on to you what what would you reflect on key skills um i would make a counter argument of patience yes you do need patience but only up to a point um i think there can be a danger in thinking that all conservatives should be super patient all the time because actually you can spend too much time on something you need to know when to stop as well uh you need to know when to step away from a project or indeed when to say actually i need some help with this so patience is definitely a virtue that we should have, but only up to a point. Um, but it's a fair point that we do need it. Um, communication has already come up, uh, hugely necessary. I think soft skills are really undersold in conservation. And uh, it's something that we need to get better at, not just managing people, but just talking about what we do. Um, outreach, uh, being willing to talk to people about what we do, and that can be doing conservation in front of people or talking about it on a podcast or on radio or on tv or whatever it is just we gotta talk about what we do because people don't know we exist and that's a real problem we're like magical pixies and people go you what now yes of course we exist we're a whole profession but people don't know so communication skills very important on all sorts of levels both internally and externally um when yeah problem solving as again i'm just gonna echo that because I think that's one of the really, really fun things about working in conservation is all the amazing problem solving that you get to do. It's, it's really fun. It's 
the best bit. <laughs> uh, Rain, I see you're unmuted. I think, what would you like to add? Uh, I would like to add, like, everything everyone else said, yes, perfect. <laughs> and my little tidbit is that always work on your own skills too, or work with what you have. Because I had the painting background, I was really good at color matching already and using my hands. Uh, but also always be willing to learn more too. I find like heritage skills have absolutely been helpful in my career. I was able to take a blacksmith workshop, which was amazing. And then I could understand blacksmiths materials more, which was amazing. I took a beading workshop, which allowed me to understand how beaded uh, artifacts are made. And if I ever need to fix one, I would know how to do it properly and with the same technique. And a brain tanning workshop, which was disgusting, but also amazing. And so I understand like how leather pieces were made and like recognizing those aspects. So if there's ever a chance you're able to take a workshop or a way to develop your skills, absolutely go for it. And it looks really good on a resume for all you other emerging people. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to, uh, one of my questions uh, after this is going to be uh, about kind of professional development and things like that. So we will come back to that uh, shortly. Uh, Julie, what would you like to add? Yeah, I'd like to echo what everyone else has said. And I think there is something about learning new skills and keeping up to date, which we'll come on to. Um, I do think you have to be, as a conservator, you have to be very aware of your limits as well um, and know when to stop and ask for help or advice. Um, so I think these are really important skills, being able to be that reflective about your practice as well is, is important. I think the key thing for me and the, the further I go in my career, the more this becomes clear to me is that um, you have to be collaborative. There's almost nothing that we do um, at work that doesn't involve other stakeholders and doesn't have other people with opinions uh, that, that want to be involved. Um, so I think you have to be collaborative. You have to be a great communicator and you have to be able to influence you have to be able to get people to see it the way you want to see it um and sometimes that means saying things like well we can't do it that way but maybe we could try this way you know so it's it's having kind of different options available and and thinking about how you speak to other people so again the soft skills as jenny mentions i think are really really important uh gwen i see you're unmuted was there something you wanted to add uh, yeah, just uh, to uh, build on something that Julie mentioned there, which is about sort of CPD, and I know we'll get on to that, but being able to not being able to not judge yourself too much for something that you did five years ago, because five years ago, that was what we thought was the best thing to do. And things do move not really, really quickly, but best practice has changed a lot over time. And sometimes, especially when I'm working with colleagues who say curators who have been doing something a certain way for 20 years, nobody's told them it needs to be different so it's not me scolding them and saying how should you not it's more like okay well no but that you're doing what you thought was the right thing so a lot of it is offering that support and being collaborative and just not trying to be like a finger pointer um or be the person who says no though often you are thrown in as the person if they want someone to say no which is also fine I don't mind being the bad cop but um yeah, I think that's uh, it's, it's really important to be able to be reflective and to learn from what you've done in the past and to also always be looking forward at how things are changing. I see a lot of nods from our panellists on that. And Lorraine, I'll give the last word on this question to you. Any key skills that, that we've missed so far? Thank you. I echo everything that everybody has said. And we're, we've been talking about communication and the stakeholders that are involved. There is a, a stereotypical view of conservators and I think it does conservation and collections care does attract a particular type of personality which can be quite introspective but people skills people management communication is so important and I was talking to a preventive conservator a few weeks ago who said if she realized how much interaction she had with people and just how much she needed in terms of people skills she would have chosen a different profession so please if you're thinking that you're going to go into this and you're going to spend all of your day staring at an object on a bench that's not what you're going in to do it's an incredibly collaborative um, uh, career so I would also want to add the problem solving yes the flexibility of thinking so if you think you've solved the problem you'll probably find halfway through your treatment that everything has changed so don't get stuck on one plan you have to have a flexibility of thinking and I really love that like Jenny I really enjoy that part of conservation the, the flexibility and the problem solving 
resilience is really important as well. There are parts of this job that can be really draining. We've said, you know, it can be repetitive. Things are quite routine. There are other parts of the job that are quite, um, they do wear you down and you feel quite drained by them. So resilience is really important also. Um, organizational skills. And even if you are working in an institution, you need business skills because institutions are businesses. So you've got time management, you've got resource management, everything that you would need to run a business you need if you are working with an institution. And I would say, which everybody will have a love of the objects. Definitely, I think, uh, yeah, we uh, are talking a lot about uh, sort of personal attributes and skills, but actually enjoying it uh, is for any job, but kind of one of the the key things and we have debated a lot uh, this summit so far about the concept of passion and I, I'm not going to get into that here but there's certainly there is something around that. I'm gonna um, sort of ask an amalgamated question from everything that's coming up in the chat um, and I think we owe it to everyone who is here in this session to uh, be realistic about what it's like getting into conservation. And there are multiple comments in the chat around, um, can I get into conservation without studying a master's? How can I get into conservation if I've done a master's in something else and I, I wanna take this route? Um, I, I would love to hear some reflections on kind of roots into conservation and what what is what is the real story what are we what are we honestly saying to people who want to get into conservation no judgment just the truth Jenny you are unmuted I'm picking on you <laughs> I think I think right now the sector has a real problem of um, people do expect you to have loads of degrees and uh, that is a barrier to entry that is recognized but it's not yet dismantled so I think honestly employers do look for those things they do um, they've been kind of been told to for ages and they still do and right now we're trying to make it so that they don't look for those things and they look for skills instead um, and there's apprenticeship stuff going on with ICON that's gonna solve some of those problems certainly but right now it's a tough market it's a, it's a tough gig it's it's i'm not gonna lie that's it's hard right now i don't know what everyone else has to say about that but it's uh not good <laughs> no I think it's it we owe it to everyone at this summit like fair museum jobs whole thing is about being realistic and it's better to be upfront. I think about the challenges that there are Lorraine uh, you're unmuted do you have any reflections for us so I've been working a lot with the teaching and training and, and sort of trying to encourage people from diverse backgrounds into conservation without going through the master's degree route and I agree with Jenny that's what it is at the moment if you turn up with a cultural heritage diploma and you're against somebody who's got a master's degree in conservation, who are they going to employ? They are going to employ the person that has the master's degree. But it is something that we are working on changing within the profession. So there is the cultural heritage diploma. There are um, year on the job training through Museum Futures, which is an arm of the British Museum. There's one coming up in 2022 that is for people who are neurodiverse and, and deaf. So that's again with the cultural heritage. Um, there's the uh, conservation technician level four apprenticeship. So that's on the job training. There's a level seven conservation, um, conservation apprenticeship, which actually trains you to be a conservator. That's being offered through Lincoln. Somebody here said that they trained at Lincoln. So that's being offered through Lincoln. That starts in 2021. There are numerous, um, numerous things being offered to people to try and get people in so that you don't have to have a master's degree. But I do echo what's being said, that actually the people, museums are going to go for, for people with master's degree. I will give you an example. I've just completed four apprentices on a cultural heritage diploma. All of them had first degrees. They all had bachelor's degrees. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And it is good to hear that there is work uh, happening and there's um, and it's the same across a lot of museum jobs that that we're just not kind of catching up as fast as as we would want to I think as well and Gwen uh, what would you like to to share on this um I think as Jenny says yeah it's tough it's really really competitive at the moment um so the last recruitment that I did for a sort of similar-ish role it's uh it was for a 
kind of collections management slash collections care project role. There were three, three roles for three years and it was a kind of second job kind of, you know, at level. And we had 250 applicants and it was soul destroying having to cut it down to a manageable number of people to interview. It was absolutely heartbreaking because there were so many people that had, you know, two, four degrees, you know. Um, and so we were looking at what practical experience people had. And so for that kind of role or for a, a collections care role, for example, when I worked in, in the National Trust for a house steward role or a uh, conservation assistant role, which I think they've changed that now. I think it's a collections assistant role, but you don't necessarily have to have a conservation degree, but a lot of people just do. Uh, and so that again, because the market has been rather saturated, I suppose, with more, more and more people with with that postgraduate qualification, then it means that employers can be as, as choosy as they want to be to a certain extent. Yes, there are other routes uh, coming in like the conservation technician role as well. Um, but um, yeah, it, it is, it's really, really competitive. But there, there, there are, I do know people that work in collections care, not in conservation, uh, sort of in terms of the nuances, it's, I suppose it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's really hard to explain the difference between conservation and collections care. Um, anybody want to give it a shot? I think collections care is kind of wider than conservation. Yeah. I, I, I see conservation as part of a collections yeah. care approach. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm head of collections care. So that department includes collections audit. It includes our registrar. It includes our preservation assistance and our box making unit. Um, it includes te technicians um, and, and conservators. So there's a kind of good mix within the team. But yeah, I, I agree, Gwen, it's, it's, it's difficult. And, you know, yeah, we're in the same position. We get fantastic, unbelievably overqualified um, candidates for almost every job that we put out there. And, and it's, it's, it's where we are in the sector and and I, I applaud Lorraine for the work that she's yeah. doing because we have to we have to fix this we have to address yeah. this because it's completely unbalanced I will say that of those three posts one of the people that we that we uh employed uh doesn't have a degree they didn't they they don't have a degree uh, but they have really good uh, practical experience from the workplace in fact from the National Trust and the National Trust of Scotland uh, Rain, I'll come to you to, to share on that as well. Yeah, like getting into the field, absolutely difficult and hard, hard. Same in Canada. And to jump on that, staying in the field can also be difficult for people. Like say, even for myself, like I've been all across Canada because I've had to, <laughs> to get these jobs. I didn't think I would move around so much, but even my teachers in school said, if you want to stay in this, you're you're going to have to move. You can't say, oh, I want to live in Toronto. Okay, that's fine. So does every other conservator <laughs> who wants a job. And so you have to be flexible as well. And it's difficult. And one of the only reasons I can do it is that I do have a very supportive family. When I'm in between jobs, I'm just a basement troll in my family's basement. Uh, I don't have a partner and I have a car. So I can just go where I need to. Not everyone has that it's difficult to get in and to stay in it as well but that's that's how it is that's how she be no I think it's really good that we that we recognize that things are not built on a kind of equitable foundation like uh and I think that's also true across museums in other roles like having uh, they used to say that like working in museums was for like rich uh, women married like with a rich husband to just like have a bit of fun like going to work oh museums um and it's not like that now it's how we're making our livelihoods but in a lot of ways the sector hasn't kind of caught up with the need to pay money to live i suppose in some instances and to have that kind of role and it is it is really difficult i'm going to move on from this oh lorraine yep i just want to throw a comment out just to get people thinking. Now, I know we're talking about fair museum jobs, but nearly 50% of the Institute of Conservation members are freelance. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about applications to museums and the competitiveness. Is it the same situation if you apply to a freelancer who's advertising a post? Are they more flexible about what they, they will accept in terms of 
qualifications you know are they looking for a mm. master's degree or is it they're more flexible and they'll say no you've got five years experience or I can see you've done this that and the other and you've tried really hard hard so come on in that's a really interesting yeah, yeah. conundrum does anyone have any reflections on that uh, throw it back at Lorraine as a freelancer <laughs> <laughs> Would you do that? I mean, would you do that? Would you take someone on that if you were? Certainly, if I had be... enough work, definitely. And uh, beginning of this year, before COVID hit, that I was getting that way, and I was starting to make soundings out, and I was looking for somebody who was at the start of their career to try and give them a foot in the door. And then, of course, COVID came along, and everything changed. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think it's when it's your own business, you you have some freedom to make different choices you know because you're writing your own job and you can you don't have an HR department breathing down your neck saying you have to tick all of these boxes and you have to do it in this particular way so I I would hope potentially that there's more scope within within the freelance but as you say Lorraine it's that is not an easy option either because taking someone on is a big big commitment um, and changes the way that that you work and changes your business and the kind of paperwork that you have to fill in so it's yeah there are no easy answers I know of lots of people that are setting themselves up at the moment as freelancers and, and looking for for work that way um and so maybe being brave and, and setting yourself self up early is the way to go and then building a name for yourself but you know I, I good on anyone that's doing that in this current climate I uh I think while we're dealing with some controversial questions I'm going to ask one from the chat which I uh, not knowing as much as I should about conservation this question is of, of high interest to me do you consider some branches of conservation to be overcrowded the comments I've heard about paintings the speciality I'm thinking of choosing have been quite disheartening any reflections anyone would like to share with me on that I would say yes, some are more overcrowded than others. So for example, I uh, have a good friend who's a weapons conservator. It's a very small market. There aren't many weapons conservators, but how many weapons are there that need conservation? In terms of paper conservation, yes, it's one of the um, courses that churn out the most qualified, you know, the, the most graduates. However, there's an awful lot of paper. We will not even scratch the surface of the conservation and preservation required on archive materials or art on paper. I think it's probably something we don't have enough insight into, to be honest. Sometimes you do hear about certain parts of conservation where it's there's a real lack of people who have those specialist skills and that does tend to be something that's hyper-specialized. Everyone's in their 80s and Box. retiring. You know, uh, it's, you know, there are bits of conservation that are like that, but Again, how do people find out about those and how do you train new people in those skills? There needs to be more of an exchange of need and like, we need to have these, we need to have the data for it. And most of the time we probably don't, unfortunately. Um, but it's a really interesting question. I'd love that someone asked that. I think it's really interesting. And maybe one way of finding it out would be to, because Icon will know, because Icon is divided up for those who don't know, um, uh, is that you can join groups and the groups are they represent different specialisms of, uh, and Scotland's got a national group as well um, and so the specialisms I guess ICON centrally would know which members were signed up to which groups and that might help because it won't just be people who are accredited it will be anybody who's sort of registered and they've you know registered to be a member of one or two groups but there yeah. isn't a group for everything <laughs> no there isn't that's true yeah no I don't think that yeah it's I, I, yeah I don't know it would only be anecdotal I think what we'd be able to say but I think Lorraine's point about paper is good because paper isn't just in museums it's also in archives and libraries um and uh archives particularly for um local authorities and governments and well actually pretty much any body body that uh holds archives you know they have a duty of care to preserve certain parts of the documentation and so there is work there but uh it's whether they're willing to pay for it i suppose 
I am going to move on to another question. Uh, actually, I'm going to ask a really simple question to Gwen specifically. Could you tell us what ICON stands for? Uh, yeah, ICON is the Institute of Conservation. Um, so that's the UK body for conservators. Uh, it's a membership organisation. Um, it's an accrediting body, so it um, accredits. It, it, it will uh, accredit conservators that have reached a, a certain level within the profession. Um, I'm not accredited yet. I'm finishing my uh, AMA, which is Associate of the Museums Association at the moment, finishing that off at one thing at a time. Um, uh, but it also does advocacy for the, uh, for the sector and the specialist groups provide uh, development and training and networking opportunities for people within the sector. And uh, Lorraine, would you like to tell us a bit more about the work of ICON as well that Gwen hasn't mentioned? Uh, perhaps we could uh, touch on salary guidelines, maybe? Um, yeah, uh, so at the moment... Uh, to, um, oh, sorry, I've got it written down in front of me. Oh, so. sorry, I wanted Lorraine to weigh in oh, as well as her, as her from her role in ICON yeah, as yeah. well, because there's two of you, I'm just trying yeah. to split it. <laughs> So I, I just typed into the chat to Louise and something that I should have mentioned when we introduced ourselves is that I'm a trustee and director of the Institute of Conservation. So I've been on the board now for four years. Um, I have a, another two years to, uh, to go as a, a trustee and director. I'm also on the Professional Standards and Development um, Committee and now chair of the Environmental Sustainability Network. And for those of you reading the ethical guidance, I was chair of the ethics task and finish group for the Institute of Conservation. So I've been doing an awful lot of work for them for some time now and with them, I should say. In terms of the salary guidance, um, that should be updated annually. Um, and we did have a very good discussion about that uh, last year because it had stayed at the same salary recommendation for a really long time. Um, and it needed to be brought up to date and to change in relation to the, the rate of inflation and to people's living costs. Um, this is a personal opinion. This is, this is not from the Institute of Conservation, but as a freelancer, I wish that they would do something around freelance rates. And I think that would give the public and institutions who are commissioning freelancers the security to know that if they're paying 20 pounds, that's probably too little, but if they're paying 400 pounds, that's probably too much. Where is a fair level? What are they getting? If they're paying 400 pounds, what do they get for that extra? And if they're paying 20 pounds and it's a really good job, why is there the difference? I really wish they would do something around freelance rates. I think that's come up in quite a few of our sessions outside of conservation as well, is a kind of lack of understanding of what is uh, a fair rate for freelancers across the board museum wise and I think that's something that as fair museum jobs will be taking up with with various relevant uh, or other organizations to kind of work on something to help all of us uh, as freelancers understand what we sh can ask for and also as uh, organizations what could be expected because we've certainly seen coming out of the I'll be I'll be completely honest coming out of the cultural recovery fund some absolutely shocking numbers uh, being asked for uh, for freelance fees uh, for roles and it is just horrendous um, I could go on but I won't um, I want to uh, come to another question on the uh, from the chat about portfolios of work having them keeping them what are they for what do they do who would like to come in give me a wave if you would like to say something about portfolios yes Julie I'll, I'll come in um, so I would say portfolios are really really important um, I think there probably isn't enough focus on them um, especially emerging conservators and when you're touting for work um, having some way of being able to demonstrate to employers what you've done how you've done it talk them through the process having that visually um, is very very helpful we host um, ICON interns at the library. We've got two at the moment, and it's a really important part of that process is that they take time to put their uh, portfolios together. Um, so I do think it's very, very important that you do that, but equally, and I talked on the CV, 
panel earlier in the week and I think may have come up in interviews but make sure you tailor your portfolio for the job that you're going for you know it, it's so so important that you're using uh, relevant examples so don't just shove everything in there you won't have time to go through it all in an interview so make sure you're picking the, the most relevant projects Thank you. And Jenny has put a link in the chat to a podcast episode about portfolios, which I suspect will answer a lot of questions people might have. I want to come on to something else because we have a, quite a lot of questions I want to try and cover. Um, I would like to talk about ways of keeping up with the sector uh, sort of professional development wise, regardless of where you are in your career, whether you're just coming in, whether you've been doing it 20 years, 30 years, you still need, you've all mentioned the need to kind of keep your skills up because things change over time. So I'd love to hear a bit about how you do that. What do you access? Where do you go to help you with that? I'm going to come to Rain first. Yeah, so I follow a lot of conservation Facebook pages, actually. There's like the Art of the Conservator. Uh, man, there's so many. I follow like five of them. But if you look up conservation or creep your fellow conservation friends, you'll find these sites. And it's always people sharing articles they've done, new resources they've done. And there's like a conservation museum listserv you can sign up for that's like worldwide where people are always putting you know, new processes, uh, new techniques, and go to conferences if, if you can as well. Like that's where I've been able uh, to learn about some new techniques and to meet other people in the field as well. And uh, I'm always trying to find new things too, like fair museum jobs, like that this was new to me and this is perfect. Uh, there's lots of ways online to, to keep up with things, especially now because of the pandemic, everything's going online now, which is great. I've been able to look at conferences based in the UK, based in Australia, uh, based in America that I never would have been able to participate in before. And now I can online. Brilliant. Thank you. And apart from listening to your podcast, Jenny, how else uh, can people uh, keep up with their with their CPD? Um, there's an amazing amount of stuff online these days. I mean, obviously, because the year has been, um, what's the polite term? A dumpster fire. Uh, <laughs> there's now loads of beautiful conferences online, webinars you can go to. A lot of them are free or very affordable. Um, under normal circumstances, you can do training courses and conferences and stuff, but that costs money. And a lot of the time, that can be really, really hard if you know, if you've not got an extremely generous employer who's just rolling in money and just loves spending their training budget on you, you might find that really challenging. But there are ways of doing this sort of thing cheaply. Online is an amazing resource. Just asking to shadow people is another amazing way of just getting more practical skills. If there's something you want to pick up on, there might be someone in your area who's like, actually, I'm a paper conservator. And you're like, I don't do paper. But you know what I could do with just that tiny little bit of you know just some hints for what I can do when I come across it in another context and skill sharing and you'd be surprised how helpful people are if you just ask mm -hmm. um, similarly if you can't afford an article that someone's written they might be able to send it to you because you're hard up and you want to know what they've been researching it's always worth asking people and talking to people and it's an excuse to network you know, just send someone an email, find someone on LinkedIn, stalk them down. It's a great opportunity to make some new friends. Any other suggestions from our other panelists, Lorraine? I would say remember CPD is not just about the skills you use in your job. So it's not just about the practical skills that you need or maybe the technical skills in terms of the science or understanding the material. CPD is anything. So you could be learning French or learning to play the clarinet or teaching yourself how to knit. That's all CPD. They are all giving you transferable skills. So remember, it's anything that you do. And I will mention one specifically, which is the Winston Churchill Memorial Travelling Tra Fellowship. Every year, they fully fund you to go away for a month to travel anywhere in the world to study something of your choosing. And I did that in 2006. And it's still giving back to me now. It's phenomenal. So I'm not sure when the next round opens but it's open to um, all UK citizens of any age. So you could, I think the old, youngest was 14 and the oldest was in their eighties. Wow, that's amazing. I've never heard of that before. And now I'm like, I'm gonna do that. Uh, any other suggestions from uh, Gwen or Julie? 
Um, I think just uh, similar to what Jenny said, like in terms of asking people, um, as a sector, as as a sector, conservation's small-ish, and it's really supportive, and so there's a lot of help out there if you just talk to someone and ask someone. Um, you know, when I moved up to Scotland, I didn't have a network uh, in Scotland because I'd worked in London and studied in Wales. Um, and just by my colleague introducing me to one person somewhere, it meant that I met a whole bunch of other people who were able to put me in touch with different opportunities um, and you know, different ways to get involved. And um, so just building a network, but in that kind of one person to another way is really good, because sometimes if you're at a conference and then just being plunged into a room of people going, oh, oh, hi, you know, what do you do? I think I think having a personal introduction does make things a lot less awkward because, I mean, I fa say I'm fairly extra extrovert, but I still find that scenario like nightmarish. Um, and yeah, as Rain said, there's so many opportunities out there now and so many of those things are being recorded. So even if it's something that you can't undertake right now, um, it's something that you can kind of, that you can get to. Um, but yeah, it, just trying to find those opportunities by using... Uh, you know searches of particular mailing lists that you might be on Jenny's podcast is really good at telling you about different things that are happening I'm not on Twitter but I I have colleagues who are and they tell me if they spot something um and uh yeah also as Rain said there's the um Global Conservation Forum um which is really good that's uh I think AIC run it and it's uh again it's a mailing list global mailing list for job opportunities training opportunities people sharing papers people asking for advice on treatments and things it's really interesting um so you do get a lot of emails um and also on the icon website there are events listed there not just icon ones but lots of different events fantastic sounds like there's loads of options i'm going to ask a question just because i personally want to know and this might make me sound very stupid uh, how do you practice your practical skills in between times Do you ever just like get something that's kind of old and a bit dodge and think I, I'm going to practice my skills on this? <laughs> I know that makes me sound so naive, <laughs> I'm sure. No, it's a great question. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, sometimes, well, but, but this is probably my background. So my parents, they love going to chair shops and stuff. And sometimes they'll just drag something home and go, can you do something with this? This is cool. <laughs> I was like, it was in the bin. I was like, okay, <laughs> fine. That's that's cool. I'll learn something new from that. But yeah, sure. Sometimes, yeah. But I'm also a really creative person. So I just love doing crafty things. And that keeps your hand skills up up to date as well. So it's it doesn't have to be that you're doing actual, well, pff, depends on what you're doing, but it doesn't have to be conservation, conservation. Like if you're just, you know, painting or knitting, like you are yeah. keeping hand skills up to date. You are doing yeah. things with your hands. Those and are really important. Things and cleaning awesome. like I That's clean like my house a lot and if, <laughs> one of my university summer jobs was a cleaner in a hospital and I think that helped me to get my first job as part along with my um, master's because I had learned to clean to a very high standard I could um, show that I could do routine tasks and I knew how to use a buffing machine uh, and for working in this historic house that's that's really useful um, so yeah it doesn't have to be like old stuff because also a lot of the things I work with is contemporary art it's not old in fact sometimes it arrives from the artist studio with wet paint so yeah thank you thank thank you for indulging my uh somewhat ridiculous question um, I'm going to come back on to a more serious uh note I'd love to know about some of the kind of challenges and pitfalls of working in conservation and collections care I'm going to come to Julie first um yeah, I mean, obviously, we've discussed that it's a difficult career to get into, and then you don't get very paid very well when you're in it. Um, but, <laughs> you know, it's, um, it can be, it can be difficult, it can be stressful. Um, it, it's best often not to think about the value of the object that you're working on. In fact, most of the time, I wouldn't know what that was. Um, because that can, that can bring nerves. Um I have worked in historic interiors where everything is precious. So, you know, you're just aware of your, your body and every movement that you make and everything that happens in a space. And that, that can be quite stressful. Um, so yeah, there, there are, there are stresses, but we all make mistakes. I have, I have made mistakes. I have caused damage. Um, I was, it's well-meaning that the work that we do, but we are interacting closely with objects. And so the risks are heightened. Um, 
And I think it's good to be honest about that and, and lean into that. Um, and it makes you more aware next time. Uh, Rain, any challenges uh, or difficulties you'd like to reflect on for us? Well, I agree that the field can be like almost perfectionist, definitely, which can take a heavy toll on yourself as well. When I was first, first starting, like my first internship, I was almost scared to bring up problems or stuff I didn't understand to my supervisor because you, you, I almost felt like I had to be absolutely perfect and I couldn't make mistakes because that's what conservators are. We're these amazing crafty gods that can fix anything, which is not true. You know, we make boo-boos once in a while or, and like reflected earlier, we can't be perfectionists either. And that's like something I've slowly and still working on in myself as well is releasing that high set of expectations. And then like another aspect, which I mentioned earlier is that it's hard to stay in the field as well. And I recognize I'm privileged that I can stay in it because I have a supportive family and like they're happy for me to be a basement troll. Not everyone has that. Not everyone can work for six months, be off six months, work six months, off six months. It's not sustainable for a lot of people. Absolutely. Thank you. And I'm going to ask a different question uh, so that we can get through them all. I wonder uh, what advice would you give someone who was thinking about working in this area or was just getting started? Jenny? Um, know your own worth. Know that you are worth a uh, good salary, <laughs> even if you're not offered that. Uh, know that you should look after yourself more than the objects. Uh, something I learned the hard way the other day was um, ask a conservator day and the hardest question I was asked that day was what do you wish you told your younger self and it's that I should have looked after myself better um, I gave myself repetitive strain injury quite early on in my career because I just kept working because it was what was expected and I didn't say no and I didn't take enough breaks and now I'm gonna have to take very regular breaks for the rest of my life to make sure that I stay limber um, I should have looked after myself as well as the objects. And I, it's a very practical and often uncomfortable kind of job that we have because there's a lot of like sometimes hunching over, sometimes you're working on something on the floor, sometimes you're lying underneath an airplane. Like it's all sorts of things that conservation can be. And you need to look after yourself. Like that's my advice. Look after Bye. yourself. Thank you. I think that's a really interesting reflection because I had exactly the same conversation in the panel about working in visitor experience in front of house. You have to look after yourself if you're on your feet all day doing that. And I think it probably follows through for quite a few museum jobs that people aren't taking enough care. Um, I'm going to just ask that same question about advice you'd give somebody uh, to uh, Julie. And then I've got one final question to end on. I think we've all said how difficult it is to get into the sector but persistence and perseverance does pay off and um, if you're willing to to take jobs that are related if not the perfect one that you're looking for and build that experience and make the most of every opportunity that you have so that you can build that for the next step in your career I think that's really important um, and again touching on what we've talked about in terms of CPD is build up your support network get to know people, keep in touch with people. Um, sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know. And, and you know, that, that really is true um, in conservation as in many other sectors. So I think um, also if you're moving into this sector, look at it very carefully. There are many, many choices that you can make. There are a huge number of specialisms that you can move into move into something you're interested in you know if, if you're going to take this path into conservation which is not easy you might as well be spending time with with materials and collections that you love so focus on that thank you i think that's excellent advice for really thinking through when you're getting started i am going to end on a nice note but also a surprise question for you all i would love to know what is your favorite thing or project that you have worked on if you had to pick one and I'm going to come around to you all I'm going to start uh, with uh, Lorraine because everyone else looks too much like they're thinking <laughs> I'm also thinking and my, my answer is they're all my favorite things I love them all um, 
I can't say that there's been any one object that stands out. I mean, there are some that stand out, for example, a scrapbook of 19th century um, policy documents for Aviva, which I stood in front of on my bench and looked at and thought, I've got no idea how to do this. And then started and got to the end of it and it was a fantastic job. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Julie, I'll come to you next. Uh, I'm gonna have to pick a massive panel painting at Falkland Palace in Fife in Scotland, which um, needed conservation. Uh, as we were planning it, uh, measuring up this huge painting, which actually had been hidden behind another painting, so we didn't even know it was there for a number of years. Um, we realised that in order to get the painting in originally, a window had been taken out of the building. Um, so it didn't travel down the, the spiral staircase. <laughs> so in order to get it conserved, we couldn't take it to conservators. We had to bring the conservators to it. So we set up a studio in a working chapel. Um, we had all the um, health and safety set up. We had visitors in, they watched the conservation happening. And, and I was kind of there managing the project and, and interacting with the, the visitors so that the conservators could actually get on with their job because otherwise they would have just spent the whole time speaking to people. But we did it and uh, yeah, so proud of that. Wow, that's, that sounds like an amazing project. Uh, Rain, what would, you, what would you say is yours? Sure. Uh, my favorite object I've worked, I like just pointy stuff and weapons for some reason. I think it's my personality, but I worked on a 1800s Brown Bess musket uh, gun, which was just cool. And I loved the different components of it. The interactions of the wood and the metal were amazing, but it also was awesome to do because I have my restric restricted and non-restricted firearms license. So that came in handy. So I was actually able to handle and do conservation work on this weapon because I had the proper um, uh, training for it. So that's, that's where other training comes in handy. <laughs> that's where growing up on a farm and getting your firearms license is useful. <laughs> Thanks. And Jenny, what about you? Oh, it's like picking a favorite child. Um, I'm going to go with a really, really giant anatomical model of a frog that I worked on once where all of the musculature was made out of wax and they'd all fallen off. So then I had to spend a lot of time watching dissection videos uh, of frogs, which was not something I thought I would ever do to be able to put them back on. <laughs> it was really fun though. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. And Gwen will uh, end on yours. Uh, mine's a bit different. Uh, I, um, I was lucky enough to work on a new interface for a building management system for managing our environment when I worked in the National Trust property with the conservation scientists for the National Trust and the uh, and our engineer from the company that provided the building management system. And it was just really interesting being involved from the bottom up. Um, I'd previously been using like the kind of back end version. They were doing a nice, pretty interface and being able to be involved from the beginning in building that system and making it do what I wanted it to do, give me the data that I wanted it to give me. And it, uh, it was such a rewarding project to be uh, to sort of see from beginning to end over about uh, 18 months. Thank you. Thanks so much. And as someone who works on collection systems, thanks for mentioning systems. Um, I, I will say a massive thank you to all of our panel. Um, you've shared so much with us and been really honest and frank about working in conservation and collections care. And I know everyone in the chat has been really appreciative. So I do encourage you to enjoy the thank yous that are coming through. And thank you all for attending this session. Um, hopefully we'll see you at some other sessions still a few days to go. Again, thank you so much for your time. Thanks everyone. I will close down the meeting in a few seconds. So um, get ready. Thank you so much. <laughs>